Welcome to the Rebel Rebel. I'm your host, Michael Dargy. The Rebel Rebel is a show dedicated to creative rebels and entrepreneurs all over the world. It's a it's a love letter to those people who think audaciously and act courageously in service of making the world a better and more interesting place. The, to be an octogenarian is actually quite normal, but we're going to be facing more and more centarians, and those centarians are going to require support. And so at the same time, we have a shrinking of the healthcare workforce. We were losing a third of the healthcare workforce between last year and next year as a permanent exit. Big, big move that I, when I left permanently is when I left to work for the World Health Organization in Europe. She's on a remarkable journey from working with the WHO to Biofarm in Switzerland, to launching a startup addressing the challenges of older care, to improv and so much more. Please welcome Jennifer Kane to The Rebel Rebel. Jennifer, how are you? Hi, Michael. I'm doing so good. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here with you today. I'm very excited to have our talk. Oh, me too. I, and uh, so uh, we, we were noticing that you got like some black leather with a white background going on. And I've got like white uh, Asteri S. Fakeri Rebel Rebel shirt with a black background going on. We're like, <laughs> we're like twinsies. I mean, it, there's some certain feng shui going on. It's as if we've channeled to each other exactly how we should look today to do exactly that. So, awesome. yeah, I hope for, for the listeners, I hope you're watching this also on YouTube because mm. you can see how fantastic the color is. It's pretty, pretty wild. It's, 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 an, pretty it's wild. insane. So, uh, Jennifer, where are you in the world? Let's let's start there. So where am I in the world? I'm sitting right now in Basel, Switzerland. Basel is a northern city in Switzerland, which is a part of the German speaking part, but we're right on the border with both France and Germany. So it's actually a tri border area. Oh my it's God. pretty interesting. It's very much a melange of culture and language, which is just a wonderful place. And if you don't know the city, know it. Come visit. <laughs> Come visit us. It is beautiful, picturesque. The Rhine River runs through it. It's Actually, a major hub for biopharmaceuticals in the world, wow. actually. Um, you've got the world, the global headquarters of several of the largest biopharma companies globally that manufacture household names in oncology and neuroscience, et cetera. So it's a wonderful place to be from a business perspective, a science perspective, getting all the meeting of the minds together. Also, art, culture, just you might have heard of Art Basel. This is the mother place of all that. <sighs> Yeah. I, and I was going to say that, you know, it, it must be, you know, all like everywhere you look is a piece of history, which is outstanding. Yeah. Uh, li well, for example, you could be walking <laughs> on a walk and you could see a pile of stones and say, oh, look, it's a pile of stones. But it happens to be, a, you know, a 2000 year old Roman wall remnant that's wow. just walking past that you're walking past. And you know, on the street, they might dig up something today and find, you know, a thousand year old boots that are Crazy. from a cobbler that, you know, it's just, it's a beautiful place to be full of inspiration. Wow. That's, a, it's so shocking, like being uh, over in North America where everything is so new and we, we tear down things that are like a hundred years old and be like, oh, make something new. And, you know, here you are. I love it. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so why don't you catch me up with what you're doing right now? Because I'm, I'm super curious. I, I mean, you, you mentioned some of the business stuff going mm -hmm. on around you, but what is it that Jennifer Kane is doing? Yeah, the Jennifer kane of it is the following. So <laughs> we talked about me living here in Basel, Switzerland. You hear from my accent. I probably come from North America, mm. correctly noted. I'm actually from the U.S. and I'm from Oregon, the West Coast. Originally. I love Oregon. Yeah, thanks. It's just beautiful. Also another incredible place. Um, and so I myself and many other people that I know who live in this city, but are also other people who are like me, who are, we'll call them expats, or people who are choosing to live another life from a commercial perspective, a business perspective, a sense of adventure. And if they're around our age, 50 something, we very often, yeah, exactly, high five <laughs> that, like the pride for being over 50, we very likely have a situation happening where we have aging parents. So we might be what we call sandwich generation people. So what that means is someone like myself who has children and also has someone who is an older aging relative parent, for example, right. that is of the age who might need a little bit of assistance. We have this issue. And so this is something that... Um, related specifically to what I'm doing right now is I'm the co-founder of a company called Viva Valet. 
And Viva Valet is a company that is designed to actually solve this problem that we have of people who are remote caregivers or children who are far away from their family members who are aging, Mm. older as we call them. Um, And so, for example, my own father is 88 years old. If If he has a crisis of surgery, a fall, or something happens, Myself, my my siblings, we all have to get on a plane and fly a great distance. And we can be there for that crisis moment. But when dad gets out of the hospital or comes back home, who's going to be there to care for them? Because we all live in different states and or countries. Right. So how do you manage that? So that's actually the solution that we have in place with our company is that we, yeah, exactly. So if you imagine like the, the website Expedia or booking.com, for example, these are platforms where you could go onto them to organize your vacation and yeah. you would never dream of going to 10 different airlines or 20 or 30 different hotels to find out which one is the right one. You go to that one that consolidates all the services that you need to make your amazing dream vacation. Yeah. That's what we're doing with elder care as well. So this, and, and what we love about it is that in order to get on the platform, to be in the membership and to give our service providers to be part of the, the pool of services that we deliver, like food delivery, you know, um, uh, great home cooked meals that are delivered to, to the homes of the olders, be it handyman services, be it cleaning, be it in-home tech rides that are also safe and accessible and soon to be pet care as well. Those companies have to pass through a rigorous levels of, of vetting, of training, et cetera. So they have to, the, the, the price of entry is trust, which is the most important right. thing that we've been discovering from all of our ethnography that we did actually with our customers before we even started. Uh, and that was going to be my question. Like how do, how do, how do we know that they're going to be yeah. good for our parents or our, yeah. our, so, our elders? Um, great. So again, cool. really great question. When we, when we conceived of this idea of what we we're doing to deliver the services for elders, We knew that we also wanted to obviously care for olders, support adult children, adult daughters very often who are doing this or adult daughters-in-law. We also know that let's in praise of daughters-in-law who are delivering this. We also wanted to support local businesses. So we didn't want to take away that business opportunity from any other local business that was already serving the community. Our desire is to work with those local businesses and actually, you know, because they're there, they know the people, they know the environment, they speak in the dialect or the language and they understand the culture locally so let's do that. Let's work with them. And then we'll also give them the extra training, do all the extra vetting, et cetera. Wow. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, as, as a, um, yeah, my, my parents are both very active. Like they're, um, but I, I just, I love this idea that, you know, you're, you're, you're thinking that way and you're, you're thinking ahead and you're, you, there's a challenge. So you found a solution to it. I, I freaking love that. <laughs> we're solving. We're very much. My founder, Mary, Miriam Perina, is also living outside, also an American, also living outside the United States. We are both very much scratching an itch that we have for yeah. ourselves. Yet, when you look at the data, you know, you've got 64,000 olders who will be over 70 in North America or U.S. Ex- exclusively by the year 2040. Sorry, 64, and so at the same time, we have a shrinking of the healthcare workforce. We were losing a third of the healthcare workforce between last year and next year as a permanent exit. So yeah. we have a lack of capacity. We know that olders want to live at home. They don't necessarily want to go into a group living situation. Plus it's expensive. In-home living, uh, in-home care is typically, um, from the U.S. dollar perspective, around sixty thousand dollars a year. In-home living starts at starts at ninety thousand. So you've got this barrier. Maybe it's a cost barrier. Maybe it's a capacity barrier. And then also when we look at things, we call the dependency ratio in the world of public health and, and epidemiology and demography, which is how many people in the community have a dedicated. Um, support for each individual older. So in the 80s, that was around seven to nine for each individual older. So there were people in your extended family who were living nearby who could support right. the older. By 2040, it becomes two to one. What? So we have, it's, it's actually becoming something of a public health demographic crisis as we roll on in years, because we have this growing baby boomer population, it's always been big and every age group it's in, now they're living longer. Yeah. And we're going, you know, the, to be an octogenarian is actually 
quite normal, but we're going to be facing more and more centarians, and those centarians are going to require support. Wow. That, okay, that's brilliant and super cool. I, I want to go back in time, though, now. Oh. I, <laughs> I want to go, because uh, I, I just love this, and we'll put all the links in the show notes and stuff like that so people can understand more about what, Thank you're, you. what you're doing. But I want to know about you, Jennifer. Like, what is it about you that, you know, had you zig when everybody zagged or, you know, took you across the world? Maybe as part of it, um, you know, looking after parents, I think, is very admirable and awesome. Uh, being a parent myself, I'd like that, um, <laughs> you know. But yeah. where does your story start with this? Like, that's, that's my curiosity. My story starts when we think about the story of Viva Valet. It's actually that moment when you realize what you have chosen to do with the next stage of your career, your whole life, my whole life has brought me to this moment. Okay. So it's like that chill inducing feeling of I'm exactly where I need to be. And I'm exactly sort of where karmically, professionally, I have delivered myself to. So um, I mentioned, you know, obviously I'm living in Switzerland. I have lived out, I've lived in Switzerland for 12 years, but I've lived outside of the United States for 24 years. Oh, wow. And uh, so almost, you know, on this time around, even before that, I had, I had some time where I was living outside the U.S. And so now I'm at this point where the majority of my life has been outside of the U.S. Um, and I, the big, big move that I, when I left permanently is when I left to work for the World Health Organization in Europe. I had already been working for the World Health Organization in Washington, D.C., and also the World Bank. And I think those were some of the big life um, major moments that I dreamed of, even as a young person. So as a young person, I always felt compelled to be looking for what is going to drive me from a purpose perspective um, in service of let's say humanity and service of people and service of how to help people have the best lives that they wish to have. My tool for that has always been in healthcare and, or now in health promotion, I would say is the play we have in Viva Ballet. It's very much yeah. adjacent to healthcare and that it's promotion. Um, but I, you know, I, I really f- saw myself doing that and for me, the big aspiration was if I work for the UN, if I work for these big institutions, if I work for the World Health Organization, that's me doing my part of yeah. making my big impact in the world. And absolutely, it was a rich, incredible experience. I'm so grateful for it in every way. And I realized I was doing that and I was thinking, huh, is that it? Is that it? <laughs> really? You dreamed your whole life to do this. You studied. I went to Johns Hopkins for my public health degree, all these things. Is that it? And I realized that I I wanted to do something more and that I wanted to be more of an actor. So I, you know, through that, continuing on this mission driven to give, to use my tools, my training, my heart, my hands to make an impact for people in public health systems and et cetera. I moved from the diplomatic world into the world of the pharma- biopharmaceutical industry, um, which is ultimately what brought, what brought me here. I was an executive in several um, companies here in Basel, mm-hmm. and I still am actually on the board of a, of a Gates Foundation project. All The entire global pipeline of all malaria products are going through this company. I'm on the board of called Medicines for Malaria Venture, which is wow. just some of life's amazing, great work. So I still continue to have a little bit of a hand in that. But, you know, we're now about almost three years on where my founder and I had a conversation, a very tenderhearted conversation one day. We were kind of soul searching, looking for what's the next step in life, Um, acknowledging that as women who are strong leaders, maybe we were done with all things that are called corporate. Uh Maybe we were finished with that. Maybe maybe we had tapped into that, squeezed all the juice of, of that perhaps even advanced to the levels that those organizations, which would allow us to be in. And then it was time to actually see the expiration date for being inside those organizations, working for someone where effectively we were rented to move on and actually invest in founding something together to build this next thing, which is again, scratching an itch where we had desperately trying to solve for ourselves and our family and also seeing the purpose ahead. So we've cr- 
created, carved out the next 20 to 30 years. We'll be, we'll be doing this in our 70s and 80s, I am certain. We'll be on the board. Maybe not, a, maybe not at, the, at the operational level, but we'll still be on the board in, in the next 30, 20, 25 years. So when, when, when we're on Forbes, you can look back and say like, and I'll, when, I, when I have the Forbes interview, I'll say, I'm so excited I did the Rebel Rebel podcast. <laughs> and make sure you go back. <laughs> in the archives. Listen to Michael, yeah. Right. Catch us on YouTube in our black and white. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Oh, exactly. that's so cool. Uh, Jennifer, it, it, it's so wicked to hear the story of realizing that you hit a point, you know, you, you got the things that you wanted, you went after them, you, you yeah. chased them down, you tackled them to the ground, you got the stuff, you had the experiences. And then to level up beyond that again, I think is so inspirational. I just, I love it. Thank you. I think, um, thank you for saying that. And I think there is... You know, for people who are listening and depending on where you are in your career, perhaps you have a huge aspiration for your life of when I do this thing, it means I made it. When I achieve this <laughs> status, this role, if I can work for this company, that means I really made it or I've proven my value or I've, I'm doing the thing that I was designed to do. Congra First of all, if you get there, congratulations. You might look around and say, is this really what I wanted? Yeah. Is, is this it? <laughs> is this it? I, I remember saying things like it, it very, you know, the, kind of the the bleeding heart of it to say, I'm going to live in a village where there's going to be no electricity and I'm going to be that person who is representing this big organization. And that's going to mean that I'm there making a, an impact. And I remember thinking, I'm living in former Soviet Georgia. We're being bombed by the Russians. We are all every bare uh, location that could be inhabitable is inhabited by refugees. We have scheduled elect we have scheduled water cuts and electrical cuts and it's winter and it's snowing oh, and it's man. cold. And I'm working inside the Ministry of Health and all of the windows are shattered out. Is this really what I wanted? Uh. <laughs> right. So <laughs> or like here we are in Bosnia and we are having to look monitor our um, landmine maps on a daily basis to make sure that we don't travel in this area. And if we do walk on pavement, because you might get blown up. So all yeah. these things really exciting yeah. and, and very purpose driven. It's the things that movies are, are made out of. And it's yeah. living that life that you think maybe as a younger person, I thought as a younger person, if I'm doing that, if I'm maybe even putting myself at personal risk to serve humanity, yeah. that was me doing my best in this world to make an impact. And I think, yes, I did. And it was still, is that it? Because I think I could do more. So for me, it was actually, you know, becoming an actor inside as now as an employer, as a, as a founder, um, and really driving uh, the, an, an entrepreneurial venture. It's really doing something totally different. We are, you know, creating jobs. We're serving a higher purpose every day with Wolders. We're alleviating the stress that we have on, on adult children and, and adult daughters. And we're developing local businesses. So it's such a virtuous loop. I'm so proud, even if it's at the micro scale right now as a startup, yeah. I see that I see where we're going with it. And it's so thrilling that we get to do this every single day. That is kick ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so um Wow, I, I mean, there, there's so much to mine, but I'm gonna I'm gonna zig. Zig, uh, go so ahead and zig away. Uh, allow me to zig. What is what is a typical morning in Switzerland look like? A typical morning in Switzerland. Yeah. So, um, first of all, the home that I live in mm -hmm. was built in 1335. Oh and I live in a, and, and tragically in 1355, there was a substantial earthquake. And so everything that was standing at that time collapsed, but the our foundation is still the same, which is very cool. Wow. And that's all preamble to say, I live in the old town. So I live in the old town, which means that it's all very old buildings. I'm looking across the street and this building is original from 1575, very old beautiful, super charming. And I live just a few steps away from a church. And so this church, this, you know, traditional sound of the European church bells, you know, seven o'clock, it's ringing, it's ringing, everyone wake up, wake up. However, that church is, is dinging every 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Also the, the charm and also the sleep disruption associated with yeah. the charm. 
And I'm watching, you know, I, I wake up, I watch the sunrise, I look out, I look out over the old city and I actually take a photo every day and I post it on social media. And for me, it is a symbol of this beautiful, gorgeous, historic view with the church spires and beautiful Erasmus, seeing the church that Erasmus von Rotterdam is buried in and the, living on the street where Erasmus and Hans Holbein lived and, you know, making the, being the port, the, the court painter of, of the Tudor family to, to be entrenched in this history. So this, the surface is the same, but the sky looks vastly different every day because we're on a hill and we see how it, how it looks differently. So for me, it always starts with that watching the sunrise and then really taking in Every day the sky is looking different. And for me, it's this analogy that in the impermanence, it's grasping the impermanence of the life that we have in that don't worry if something's going great, don't, don't worry, it'll change. But also if, not, if something's really going off the rails, also don't worry because it's going to change like the weather change, like the cityscape, the visuals around this beautiful um, this beautiful setting looks every day. So for me, that's absolutely essential. Um, if I'm really lucky, I get to walk along the Rhine because the Rhine river is just also about a block and a half away from my home. And then that's really special if I could take my little doggies out for a walk. Um, since we, um, Viva Valet is actually, op our operations are in the U S they're specifically operating in Chicago, but we actually have different, we have company, sorry, our company is divided into different countries where a lot of the work is performed. Oh, so for me personally, I wouldn't say it's a Basel tradition, but it's a gen tradition, which is, you know, my, my, my business partner is in Asia. My development team is in Asia. And a lot of my, my social media team is also in India and Asia and, and, um, other parts of the world. And we are working really early in the morning to get everything done. That's come overnight from Chicago to say, we have a problem. We have this issue. Can you fix this tech? Can you help us prepare this new presentation for a sales call that we're going to have later today? We're doing that all day, preparing for our, our operations in Chicago to open up. Um, so that's when, so like we're in the, we're in the time zone now where it's their morning yeah. and it's the end of my day here in Switzerland, but I'm still supporting them up until around 10 o'clock my time. Wow. Yeah. Holy so that's, I mean, a Swiss day, like anything, like it could be anything. It could be a, go out and have a beautiful coffee and a beautiful pastry, take a beautiful walk, walk through the old town, see also some of the world-class architecture as well. Yeah. In fact, this might be of interest as someone who's worked in, in entertainment yourself, since Basel is so very old and it has beautiful old architecture, we're also the home of Herzog and de Meuron. And that is one of the really up and coming or rather established modern architects. So you know them from their work in the Beijing Olympics. They designed the, the bird's nest. They're based here in Basel. Okay. So you see a lot of this coexistence of really old architecture with really hyper modern, beautiful, beautiful things. The Disney company comes to Basel to study how do you have these two parts of architecture fit together? Wow. Because so when they're when they're looking at the construction and 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 modifications of their parks, because they have the same kind of coexistence of architecture and art to say, all right, we want to have this cozy, sweet, kind of European mm. style looking village like around the fairy tales, but maybe we want to have hyper modern for some of the you know Avengers rise that they have. <laughs> that that they're kind of looking at Basel as a way that you can put those things together. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Oh, what, so <clears throat> let's flash forward for a second. Where, what, where, where does Jen go next? Where does, where does she go geographically? Yeah, I could be geographically, could be professionally. Could, I mean, you're, you're growing this, this Viva Ballet empire, which is super dope. But what, what happens next for you? Like, <laughs> So what happens next for me is I think we keep growing this business. I think we've decided this is going to be the 20 to 30 year commitment. Yeah. We keep growing this. Um, for me personally, as an individual, one thing we didn't talk about along the way for me is that I've also become an improviser. So we're all improvisers. Like, first of all, everyone is, right? Who isn't? <laughs> yeah. And for me, it's actually something that... 
um, I've trained formally. So during during COVID, that was really my passion project is that I, I was able to attend Second City, both the improv program and conservatory. And um, that's something that I've actually developed in Basel as well as I'm the director of a theater program, an improv theater program, oh where I God. teach students, we perform regularly, we also do a lot of corporate events, and there's a lot of leadership components with improv and oh yeah, for sure, and 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 uh, and leadership and, and business. So much of those things that we're doing are actually incorporated also into Viva Valley, in that um, we have taught improv to caregivers. We have taught improv to olders themselves. It is like watching Benjamin Button. It is <laughs> the most beautiful. And I think of all of the you know, different companies or huge audiences we've had, sold out shows. Yeah. I think the most special experience for me in improv has been teaching improv to olders because I see that it really does release the creativity and it does draw cohesion and it wakes something up in them that might have been invisible yeah. because very often the fear you know hope streams concerns of olders is that they're becoming invisible right. we know the most unhealthy decision we can take is actually retiring yeah. and so because you don't want to have a life of inconsequence and what i see when we teach improv to olders is that they actually become alert they become focused they become hyper present they become hyper connected to those people around them and they feel like they have purpose. Yeah. So I see that the future of me is going to be involving, continuing to develop this, I think independently as an artist, I think also as a leader, utilizing those skills to unleash the potential in others, be they, be they in healthcare or elsewhere, and also hardwiring that mindset, that yes and mindset into my company, into my service providers, into my staff, into everything we do and into how we serve our, our, our customers as well. And hopefully as we expand, we will be doing more and more to give these tools to caregivers because we believe that's actually how we're going to you know, improve the whole caregiving cir circuit. I think wow. that improv is part of my present for sure and my future. Probably, you know, when we sit back and we, you know, we're public and we're <laughs> valued at five billion and whatever, that's, yeah. yeah. So that's the moment where, you know, if I'm ever going to leave, it's probably I'm opening my own private theater and I'm going to make it public source. <laughs> And I'm going to, I'm going to provide as much training as I can to anyone who needs it, because I believe it is an essential skill for being human. hundred <clears throat> percent. Could not agree with you more. Oh, that's, that's yes. Awesome. And yes. And yes. And, um, wow. That is so cool. Um, I, I'm, I'm in favor. I can't wait for you to open your, your theater. I'll, I'll be, I'll be waiting. You'll be waiting. Okay. Be waiting. Hopefully we can get to you virtually first. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. I I love that. Um here is so I mean Chicago is, you know, one of the birthplaces of improv. Um, as is, I don't know whether you know this or not, but Calgary, Alberta, Canada, which is where I'm from. Because Del Close came from Chicago. He long long form improv and then uh short form improv with um Keith Johnstone here in Calgary back in the day. So there's a, even more crossover. Isn't it amazing? And I actually trained in Toronto. Oh, that's awesome. So it was actually part of the Toronto and, and the, you know, that's all think of the legends that came out of that particular school, but oh, all yeah. of the whole second city system is just incredibly impressive. Yeah. So, so um, yeah. Oh, that's fun. I love that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so let's just say, and I don't know what, what's a, what's a street name with a cafe on it close to you. Street name with a cafe. Yeah. Um, it could be well, Marked Platz, for example. Right. There's a cafe in Marked Platz. So let's say you're, you're walking down Marked Platz, mm -hmm. and you're thinking to yourself, "Ah, oh, I just wish the world knew this one thing." What is the one thing that Jennifer Kane wishes the world knew? So I have to come back to improv. It's the power of yes and. <laughs> I think we live in a yes but world. Mm. And if only, if only people could just know this one thing that they all are really superheroes walking around with untapped superhero potential is that if you did this one thing, 
instead of being in a meeting or being with your family or being anywhere at the, at the, at the, at the cash register and said, yes, but, oh, yes, but it's a, it's a nice day, but yes, it's, it's, it's sunny, but it's going to rain later. What a downer. What a, <laughs> however, again, the first rule of improv, yes, yeah. and. Yeah. All you have to do is change one word in how you typically respond to anything, any question. Instead of yes, but say yes, and, and you have unlocked the potential of creating magic every single moment you interact with another human. So I actually, um, I'm really proud I did some TED Talks about this, actually. Um, so you can find those. Maybe we'll they're on the show notes. <laughs> Or, or wherever they are, wherever I put them. Or here, or there, 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 here, or <laughs> up here, 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 here. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the power of yes and, it is transformational. And I remember during COVID, for example, we really talked about how can we use this moment as a moment to say, we're going to jumpstart creativity. We're going to jumpstart, even though we're physically separate from each other, we're going to jumpstart co-creation. We're going to do- jumpstart cohesion and feeling like I belong and I'm part of something, even though I'm not physically together with others. That was really like a huge part of yes. And for me of, of using that mindset, it's sure you could say, Oh, Jen, that's in theater. It doesn't work in real life. Actually it's applicable for everything. So what we found is that, you know, unleashing creativity. Yes. Finding a way to connect with others, finding a way to short circuit conflict and finding a way to move through conflict because it's not about fighting conflict as it doesn't exist. But if you are, if you and I disagree, I can say, Michael, yes. And I agree with you on this part. And have we considered this other set of data, this other perspective, this other way? And can we continue to agree that we want to develop our relationship further and keep building on this idea? And what do we do next? And what do we do next? Yeah. Exactly. So I think that's that's really it. Like there are a lot of things I would love people knew, but for me, that's the most essential way to be human is just change one word out of a commonly thing you say. Instead of yes, but say yes and and watch magic happen for you. Oh, I love it. Outstanding. You are a busy, busy woman. Yes. Um, do you have time for things just for Jennifer? Yes, I do. <laughs> what are those yes, things? Yes, I do. So it's probably back to, you were talking about, you were asking me earlier, what's a typical morning in Basel yeah. or Switzerland? But I think a typical morning for Jen is very regimented around um, a, a series of practices which are restorative and are um, restorative and I think are part of, let's say, healing or part of grounding myself. Um, and so again, every morning, um, I would, I would protect about the first 45 to minutes to 60 minutes every day to do the following. So wake up, um, lymphatic massage, self lymphatic massage to start the day. I never get sick. Hmm. I never get sick. So, um, Dr. Perry Nicholson, I love you. You are incredible. You're a gift to me. Um, follow him on Instagram, put him on your podcast, Dr. Perry Nicholson. He, um, is a passionate osteopath who is teaching lymphatic practices. So again, that's two minutes. So like do that. I I do, I do a meditation, um, typically, which could last anything from 15 to 45 minutes. I will do, um, lemon water. I'll do, you know, my coffee and things like that. I've also, um, this weekend I was just doing a Wim Hof workshop where I did cold exposure. And so I've started to recently incorporate that too. So that could be, um, there's a a fountain across the street for me. So that's always flowing with water, which week it's potable, but you know, it's a big fountain that you can, in the summer we swim in them, but in the winter they're cold. So you cut the ice off of them and get in. I will do, I'll do two minute cold exposure in the ice water out there. I'll do a cold shower. Yes. No. And I mean, in Calgary, I'm sure you can just go roll in the snow. (laughs) So I'm finding that all those practices are setting me out, setting me up for, let's say, mental concentration, focus, allowing me to ground myself, allowing me to also, you know, visualize we're creators, right? We are creators of our own reality. And all those things lined up, help me do that on a daily basis. Wow. What's a guilty pleasure? What's a thing that you do 
Yeah, just for you. Man, I live in Switzerland. So what do we have? Chocolate. We have hot cheese and we have hot molten cheese <laughs> in your figure eight and your fondue pot. Yeah. We have hot cheese and we have chocolate. Yeah. So I will say the hot cheese I do a couple times a year, but uh, yeah. we mentioned we're over 50. So we're feeling a little bit inflamed after eating sure. something like that. But yeah. I would say never a day without chocolate. Chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. And for me, I'm I would, like, my sweet spot would be about 90 to 95%. Yes. Cocoa. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. I, I was going to say 100%. But yes, it, not, <laughs> I love the dark, dark stuff. And it's really good for you. Yeah. It's actually really good for your brain. And it's good for, it's good for your lymphatic system as well. Yeah. So get all that garbage out. Eat chocolate uh, every day and cheese every other day. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now with more cheese. I love that. <laughs> more cheese. We more all, cheese. you know, we love cheese, right? It makes us happy. Yeah, it's a chocolate, um, you know, I don't, I don't, do I even call it a guilty pleasure? I'm not so sure I, I call it a guilty so. pleasure. It sounds just like a like, health choice to me. Yeah. yeah. The guilty pleasure, I think, would be if I decide to not have the, the if I decide to eat the chocolate, that instead of being the high cacao concentration it would probably be the one that's like milk chocolate that's mixed with cornflakes that would be the oh, guilty pleasure yeah because then you're like i'll just have one whole bar so you just start you know <laughs> and just, it, it, it's it's magic chocolate it disappears you put, yeah. you open the you open the wrapper and it just disappears instantly yeah. it's like nothing happened <laughs> nothing to see here move along exactly, exactly. um what if is, is there do you have time to read mm-hmm and, and if so, what's on your bookshelf? Like what? So books? I'm. I would say I have time to read and I have time to listen very often. So I'm on these. If I'm driving in my car, if I'm cleaning the kitchen or cooking, I'm often listening to podcasts. Nice. And I'm often listening to um, to books. So let me just look up. What if I? I've, I I'm I'm a big um, audiobook lover. So I'm just going to look at my Audible. Um. Well, you're a puppy. I know my dog is is in doggy jail currently oh. because um, he knows that um, I know that if he he would be trying to jump on my lap right now. So sorry, Monty. Um, <laughs> so I, I've I've recently read Us, okay. um, which is a, t- a, t- a tough one. I think also you know I'm I'm in the process of going through a divorce, and I think looking at the other side of all of that on what I'm often calling the other side of marriage. Yeah. Um, so, you know, on, on the other side, we're looking at, you know, what, what are aspirations for marriage if we don't have one? And then once we have a marriage, what are the aspirations we have inside the marriage? And then it's really looking at how do you kind of do the postmortem on it? How do you move forward? So a lot of those things are actually dealing with that kind of stuff. So for example, um, that, so this book called us, um, my colleague has written a book that I really, really loved, um, that helped me understand some neurodivergence, um, super, super helpful for me. Um, so wrote a book. So us, by the way, is called Terrence Wheel. It's the author is Terrence Wheel. I love, love this one. Um, helping to understand some of the some of where, how we get where we are in a marriage and how to get through. And sometimes even on the postmortem side of it, it's still very useful. Mm. Um, but my colleague, Brett Stevens, has written a book called Crossing, Bas- Crossing Over and Crossing Back Over, which is about his own neurodivergent journey. And I think for me as a leader of people that constantly looking for ways to understand another person's perspective, to be empathetic as a leader of people that are always going to be different and Please always be different. So we are in our company designing for diversity. We're demanding inclusion. So we're looking for people who are different, who are rebels, like your podcast. We are looking for those rebels. And sometimes those rebels uh, arrive in different packaging. And so this is also looking at um, bringing in people who are neurodivergent, which I really enjoyed because they they have superpowers, see things that we don't see. Um, that's really great. Um, 
I'll put, uh, we've, we've got a thing on the website, <clears throat> which is where to buy books. So every guest, um, this last season, anyways, <clears throat> we've started putting links to the, the books that the guests recommend. So you can buy oh, them right off the website. There. I love that. I love that. Yeah. So yeah. we'll put the Brett Stevens books in. For also, sure. um, I think you probably have had this mentioned in your podcast as well, is that James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, like oh, yeah. essential reading, absolutely essential reading. Yeah. Have loved, have loved it. Um, um, so much. So that that's some of the stuff that I've I've got going on right now. Think again. I'm a big Adam Grant fan as well. You know, think yeah. again. Um, and his book on resilience that he did together with with Cheryl Sandberg also super helpful. Also, um, the Jay Shetty book, the book, the new Jay Shetty book on love. I'm working my way through that as well. Oh, I don't know it. I'll check it out. So let's see. It's. This, if you know who Jay Shetty, you know who Jay Shetty is, right? I do not know. Oh, okay. So Jay Shetty was a monk. He's a British thinker. Um, what do you, author, thinker, podcaster. He has what he's calling the number one or identified as the number one health podcast. Wow. Um, uh, and I, I, he, he has also acted as a minister. He married Ben Affleck and JLo. So like, oh my God. you know. Bless you. Um, but he he was a monk and he left the monk life to actually bring the principles of monk life into, you know, our conversations on how to be better people, how to have a healthier life. So his first book was called Think Like a Monk, which is really great and helps you like ground yourself and get through some of life's trials and tribulations. And his latest book is called The Eight Rules of Love. And it is talking about the eight rules of the sort of monk life that he experienced and how do you apply those rules into love, the loving in relationships, how to be a more loving person. And of course, what does it all boil down to is if you're going to give love, the first person you need to love is yourself. Right. So it's using those principles from the monk life and meditation into being a better partner for yourself first before you can actually love someone else. Oh, love it. I, I, gang sign, monk life. The monk <laughs> life. <laughs> the monk life didn't choose yeah. me. I chose you. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or, I don't, <laughs> maybe you're also watching, uh, listening to the diary of the CEO by Stephen Bartlett. Like I have his book. Oh, yeah, book he's great. I'm reading, I'm reading right now actively and I love his podcast as well. Super, yeah. Super he's got good. some great guests. Yeah. Um, always, always insightful. I, I, I enjoy how he approaches interviews and the questions he asks or, and the, his ability to listen as well, which I think is great. Right on. 100%. Uh, so, one of the, my, my favorite part, well, there's no favorite part. Who am I kidding? Um, <laughs> one of the parts of the show that I love the most is um, advice that our guests give others. So, and you've given a lot um, already. And I'm, I'm thinking specifically about the people that, you know, maybe they're at the World Health Organization and have decided that, you know, this has been really great and they've enjoyed themselves and they're happy that they did it and they feel that they've done service to others, <clears throat> but they're ready to go off on their own. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps they're, uh, a, they're a young woman who is just graduating high school and she's like, oh, I really want to change the world. What mm -hmm. advice would you give to those rebels about how to, what, what, what happens next? So I think there's two pieces of advice and it's actually the advice I also give my children who are 13 year old. That's fun. <laughs> that's fun. Right. 13 year old daughter. Great. I only welcome. had sons. I only had and sons. And, so and I don't... a 16 year old son. You're welcome. Right. Yeah. So we're in the middle of it. We're in yeah. this. Um, so the advice I typically give them and I would give others as well who are again at the other end of the career journey, maybe starting is, I mentioned before, we're rented. So if you're going to work in a company, if you're going to work in a corporation, um, your talents are super valuable. And those talents that you have and the aspirations that you have, you can probably go further than you ever, ever dreamed of in your wildest imagination. That's how I feel about my own life. Like wilder than the wildest dream come true is the life I'm living versus what I who I was as a teenager. Right. However... You can, you can live that big life and you can have those big aspirations and you can make that big impact and know that if you're working for someone else, you're rented. And that's okay because you they are renting your talent. They're renting your time. Right. They're renting the potential that you have. And you're also renting them. And that's a relationship that isn't actually forever. So you could move on 
at any given point if you're not if it's not working for you number one and if you really truly want the sense of ownership you really need to start something on your own so i think that's one piece and the other piece is people who are really looking forward prospectively what do i want to do how do i want to make that impact kind of take a breath and know that if that's your mission if that's the way you feel realize there will be different things that you do along in your life that you'll pick up as tools in order to deliver that mission but you don't need to also be married to any of those individual pieces of work or pieces of career or industries that you're working in and what i tell my children is you know they're in critical time especially in europe you have to really commit by the age of mid teens to which direction you're going to go in into a pro- potential profession and what i've said to them is take a breath know that what you're going to do as a vocation probably doesn't exist yet and i know for myself the <laughs> big things that made me maybe famous in my career they didn't exist when i was a teenager either You know, I working in Eastern Europe, who would have known when I was a teenager the wall was going to fall or I was going to get a chance to go and do this work with WHO and bring country new countries from be, behind the iron curtain into the European Union. That who would have dreamed that? So those things the, or, or or the kind of jobs that I did inside pharma or now doing a tech company serving olders. Right. No one would have thought of that. So those things that you're going to do as a vocation and will catch your attention to be a source of income do not exist yet and therefore really invest your time into doing something that you love do something that sets you alight if you have curiosity about something dig into those problems explore those problems some of those problems are very difficult to solve so don't necessarily invest in the solving invest in the exploring of the problem and get really creative around how you understand a problem because that's going to be a source of inspiration potentially for a future vocation future future place of work future founding situation like what we did with Viva Valley but just keep leaning into your curiosity and know that you're going to be okay that's the magic word curiosity is a magic word if we can build a world where people are curious that is the place i'd like to live in yes and yeah. <laughs> jennifer kane this has been in just so enlightening and lovely thank you so much for the time that you've spent this has been great Thank you Michael. I'm going to give you some hearts. Hopefully they come up as well. Oh, There we go. Nice. Do I You're get... welcome. <laughs> I don't know if mine welcome. does that. Uh, This is <laughs> been great. such a great talk. Thank you for having me on the show. Um and best of luck. Um I'll continue to keep promoting your site as well and your podcast. I love it. I love the talks you have on. So thank you for doing some good and helping inspire the next generation of entrepreneurs through your awesome podcast. Oh, thanks Jennifer. This has been lovely. <laughs> I've been your host Michael Dargy and this has been the Rebel Rebel podcast. It's a podcast for creative rebels and entrepreneurs all over the world and hey, if you're a rebel or you know a rebel, why don't you head on over to the rebelrebelpodcast.com and fill out our guest request form. We'll get back to you within 24 hours and maybe we can share your story with the world. Don't forget to like, share or subscribe wherever you get your favorite podcasts and thanks so much for listening. Until next time.